Hello, this is Brett Martin, and welcome to the podcast at Chesbro Baptist Church. This is kind of a change from the traditional message that we normally preach, and I get into some deep theology here this morning. But the title of the message is Why I Am Not a Calvinist. So, please enjoy. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'd like to say before we get into this this morning that this is not going to be the traditional message that I preach, structured the way I usually structure a message. This is a subject that's been on my heart the past month or so. If anybody's looked at my Facebook feed, you'd know what it is. But the Lord has been impressing upon me to teach on this. And so I'm going to teach on it because I feel that's what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. I'm going to be giving, I'm going to be throwing a lot of scripture at you today. We're going to turn to a few of those scriptures, not every one, but I'm going to be throwing a lot of scripture at you. I'm going to get really, really deep. We're going to talk about some deep theology this morning. And if I lose you, I'm sorry. Uh, Go back to the podcast and re-listen to it. But I, I do believe this is something that we need to know. So it's really deep, just... Just follow along if you can, which I've no doubt you'll be able to. Um, but if you have your places in First Peter chapter 1, I'm asking you to stand, respect and reverence the Word of God so we can read our, our, our one verse this morning. The verse we're going to read is verse number 2 of First Peter 1. The Bible says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Get ready for it. Here's the title of the message. The title of the message is, Why I Am Not a Calvinist. Why I'm Not a Calvinist. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've done for us today. Lord, I pray that you'd be with this message. Lord, you laid this message on my heart. I know it's for the people. And Lord, I pray that you would just help me to do justice to what you've given me. Be with us. Help open our minds and hearts to receive the word of God this morning. Praises in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Why I am not a Calvinist. Now, Uh, Like I said, this isn't going to be a traditional message that I preach, but the Lord has laid it on my heart over the next few weeks. We just got back from vacation, and uh, we had a a really good time on vacation, and the the boys had never seen things like how I showed them, and it's just really great to, you know, take your children up there and have them experience things for the first time. I think Rock City was their, one of their favorite things because it was the first thing that we did. And they just had a great, wonderful time. But while, we're, while we were in the Smoky Mountains and we went up to our cabin on top of a mountain and it was hanging off of a cliff and it was a log cabin and it was cool and crisp outside and the leaves were changing and there's raccoons and bears everywhere and uh, we go in at night and upstairs my family's tucked away in their nice soft warm beds and I'm downstairs studying Calvinism. <clears throat> Praise the Lord what a vacation. No I'm just kidding. I had a good time with it. Um, but you know this is something that the Lord has laid on my heart and so we're going to talk about it this morning. And I've got a lot of information to give you, so I've got to get through it as quick as possible. I had to cut a lot of this out, because the first time I timed it, <laughs> you wouldn't want to know how, much, how long I preached it. But I had to cut some of it out to cut it down a little bit. And so we're going to go through this message. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by asking some questions and answering those questions. And then those questions are going to morph into statements, and I'll let you know. When I get to a main point, I'll let you know. Uh, but here's, here, here's my first question this morning. Why preach against Calvinism here at this church? Why do it? We here at Chesbro Baptist Church, we are not Calvinists. We are not Calvinists. In fact, when I was interviewed to be the pastor of this church, I was asked the question, are you a Calvinist? And if I would have answered yes, there's a very good possibility I'd not be the pastor of this church right now. Because we are not Calvinists. So, 
you know, some would say preaching against Calvinism here at this church is kind of like preaching to the choir. You know, why preach on it here at this church? Well, my answer to that is it is always good that we know why we believe what we believe. We need to know why we believe what we believe. Let me tell you something. Calvinists are very convincing. If someone tells you that they're a Calvinist, I guarantee you they are an expert at it. The reason is because they have to study so hard to understand it and to defend their position. And so if somebody is a Calvinist, I guarantee you they're an expert at it. And, 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 and so what, what they're going to do um, is, uh, is they're going to start quoting verses to you. And let me tell you, these verses by themselves, they're going to sound convincing to you. They're going to sound very convincing. And uh, you're not going to know how to answer them. They're going to start talking to you and giving you voices to defend their position. And you're going to go, um, 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 and not going to know how to answer. And they're going to walk away from the exchange thinking they're right. And you're going to walk away from the exchange with doubts. But let me make myself clear real quick. You will do not try to do this. You will never unconvince a Calvinist. You can't do it. You will not be able to do it. A Calvinist sees the Bible through a Calvinistic lens, and they will never see the Bible any other way unless God himself shows them and changes them. Me and you will never be able to unconvince a Calvinist. So I am not here... I am not here. This message isn't for Calvinists. This isn't for them. This is for me and you. Uh, It's going to be more productive to ram your head into a center block wall than try to dissuade a Calvinist. You'd be more productive doing that. So this message isn't for Calvinists. This message is for me and you. So me and you know why we believe what we believe. It's so me and you won't be coerced down an unbiblical, heretical path. Next question. Why preach against Calvinism at all? Why preach against it at all? Well, I believe Calvinism is dangerous. Not because I believe that Calvinists themselves go to hell, uh, although I do believe Calvinism sends people to hell. Look, many Calvinists, have no heart for evangelism, have no heart for evangelism. Some do, but many don't. I mean, if God's already decided, if God's going to do it all, if God's already decided who's going to go to heaven and God's already decided who's going to go to hell, why evangelize? Why, Why go out? Calvinism distorts the gospel. Calvinism makes God the reason why people go to hell. Calvin, another thing Calvinism does is Calvinism pushes an intellectual-based fellowship. It pushes an intellectual-based fellowship. When a, a Calvinist, when people are Calvinist, then Calvinist theology becomes the focus of the Christian, with the focus being on an intellectual. You know, uh, Calvinists, they make up a lot of intellectual sounding terms and they're filled with intellectual pride any time they argue down an Armenian, which that's what we are, by the way. We're Armenians. More on that later. And uh, so, uh, uh, by the way, um, uh, the, the point of our Christian fellowship should not be intellectual superiority. That shouldn't be the point of our fellowship. Our God wants us to be tender hearted towards one another. How can we help one another in soul and in mind and body? How can we build each other up, not tear each other down? That's the point of Christian fellowship. Look, and the Calvinism doesn't do that. So next question, what is Calvinism? Now, I can't teach against Calvinism without teaching you a little Calvinism, okay? I got to teach you some in order to teach against it, okay? So what is Calvinism? It, Calvinism's complicated, but if I had to boil down Calvinism, just a few statements, here's what the statements would be. It's a belief that God chose some people to go to heaven, God chose some people to go to hell, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Basically, 
That is Calvinism. Now, you may say, Brother Brett, that's crazy. I would never believe something like that. I would never believe something like that. Well, you say that now, but then a Calvinist starts spitting Bible verses at you, and you can get confused very quickly. You can get confused very quickly, and you might not be so sure. So very quickly, I'm going to give you, as quickly as I can, I'm going to give you the five principles that Calvinism is, is built on. These are the five what they call doctrines of grace. And it's in the acrostic TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And each letter stands for a different statement. The first, uh, the T, stands for total depravity. Here's what total depravity means. Total depravity is, means that man can do absolutely no good whatsoever. Okay, so far, I'm on board with this. Up to this point, I'm on board. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are not good. We are sinful. We do have no good in us. So at this point, I'm I'm on board with it so far. But then Calvinists take it a step further. And Calvinists say that we are so incapable of doing good that we can't even do the good thing of accepting Christ. God has to do that for us. That's what they mean when they say total depravity. Now, if a Calvinist was here right now, I'd ask the Calvinist some questions. I would say, can can a man do good works if he is not a Christian who was born again? Of course, the Calvinist would answer no. And so far, I'm okay with that. Then he quote Romans 14, 23, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Okay, so far we're good. And then I'd ask this Calvinist, can a man want to be born again and then follow instructions on how to do it? And the answer the Calvinist would give me is no. Okay, you just lost me. You just lost me. But he would say no. He'd say that'd be like giving a dead man in the grave instructions on how to be alive and expecting them to do it. They say a dead man can't make themselves alive. Then they'd quote John 6, 33. It is the spirit that quickeneth and the flesh that profiteth nothing. Okay, so I'd ask this Calvinist another question. I'd say, can a man accept Christ as his personal savior so that he becomes saved after that? And the Calvinist would say, of course not. Accepting Christ is a good work that can only be done after somebody is regenerated. You, so regeneration comes first, and then you have faith. That's the basis of Calvinistic theology. And, and, and John, then they quote you John 6, 44, which says, No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. You see how they're using Bible verses to build their case? And then I ask him another question. Can you offer salvation to anyone? And then they kind of snicker and say, that's surely impossible. One might as well offer food to a dead man than offer the gospel to a dead sinner. If he, then they'd say, if he, quote Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. And, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And the Calvinists would make this statement, and they would say, only God can make us alive. God does this without, sovereignly without our aid and without us asking. And then they'd say, from beginning to the end, Jonah 2, 9, salvation is of the Lord. That's what a Calvinist would say. So what's our response to total depravity? Let's stick a pin in that. We're going to come back to total depravity a little later on. So what's the next one? The next one is U. U stands for unconditional election. This, this simply means that God chooses some people for eternal life and uh, he chooses them without looking for anything good in return as a condition for him loving and saving them. Before any man or woman is born, in fact, before the world began, before the world was made, God decided who would go to heaven. God decided who would not. Before they did anything good, before they did anything bad, God chose some people and rejected others. And then they'd quote Acts 13, 48. 
And it says, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Oh, oh, and the people that reject, they have no choice but to, to, to reject. They've got no other choice. John 10, 26, but ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. You know, this is the next logical step for a Calvinist. If I can't do anything good and accepting Christ is a good thing, then that means I can't even do that. So this, this is the next step. So I, I can't do anything to be saved because doing that is good. And as the holy prayer, I can't do anything good. Next is L. Ooh. And you want to hear something that bo boils my blood. It's this L. The L stands for limited atonement. Here's what a limited, limited atonement means. Calvinists claim that Christ did not die for all men. Christ only died for the elect. Calvinists teach that, that Christ only died for his sheep. And then they'll take you to John 10, 11. And they'll say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. They say that, that, that the atonement is limited to the elect of God and the sins of the elect are paid for on the cross, but not anybody else's sins. Those sins and those sins only of the elect are the ones paid for. This is outrageous to me. Because the Bible clearly teaches that Christ died for the whole world. It even says those exact words. 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Calvinists claim that Calvinism is the gospel, and the truth is that Calvinism, Calvinism attacks the gospel, Calvinism denies the gospel, and Calvinism in itself is a false gospel because it denies the fact that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And do not think that 1 John 2, 2 is the only verse I have to prove that Jesus died for everybody. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hebrews 2, 9, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. 1 Timothy 2, 6, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not sack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Limited atonement, my hind leg. Quickly, with the last two, I stands for irresistible grace. This simply means that God's grace to be saved cannot be resisted. You will be dragged kicking and screaming into heaven. There can be nothing you can do to thwart God's plans to take you to heaven. They say the certainty of God's salvation for the elect is seen in John 6, 37, where Jesus says, all that the Father hath given me shall Come to me. There is no doubt we'll be saved. That's irresistible grace. And then finally, the last one is P, and it stands for preservation of the saints. Now, look, there are some people out there that are so dead set against Calvinism that they try to refute this last one. Preservation of the saints is actually something I agree with. Preservation of the saints is, is something that, that's a Bible doctrine. Once saved, always saved. We believe that. Bible says in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So there's actually, and, and remember this phrase, we're going to go over it again. It's an established biblical principle. Remember that phrase, established biblical principle. We're going to go over that again. It is an established biblical principle that, that once saved, always saved. There's plenty of other evidence in the Bible to support that. So they got me with the P, but they lost me with the rest of it. Now, here's my next question. 
What is a practical, non-biblical argument against Calvinism? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. It's really a really short point, but I think it's something that we need to talk about. What is a practical, non-biblical argument against Calvinism? I thought this was the best one that I could find. Calvinism has only been around for about 500 years or so. If Calvinism was the point of the gospel, and if Paul and Peter and all the apostles, that's what their purpose was, was Calvinism. How come none of the disciples of Paul taught it? How come none of the churches that they started taught it and passed it down? If that was the point. I mean, it only come on the scene about 500 years ago or so. So how come it wasn't, how come it didn't come 2,000 years ago? How come the disciples of Paul and the disciples of Peter and the churches that they started and the churches that those churches started, how come they didn't teach Calvinism? Hmm, interesting question, isn't it? Next question. Is predestination real? You may say, Brother Brett, I would never believe in predestination. You don't have to worry, Brother Brett. I'd never believe in predestination. Predestination is not in the Bible. I would never believe it. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. You ever see that old Prego commercial? It's in there. All right, well, predestination is like Prego spaghetti sauce. It's in there. It's undeniably in the Bible. Make no mistake, the doctrine of the elect and the doctrine of predestination is in this book. Let me read you some scripture. Romans 8, 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans eleven five. Even so, at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Romans eleven seven. 7, what then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Uh, Ephesians, uh, uh, the Romans eleven twenty eight. 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Ephesians 1, 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1 11, whom we also obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. It is unmistakable. It is undeniable. The doctrine of predestination is a real thing. Let me tell you something. It's not something we have to be scared of. It's not something we have to sweep under the rug. It's not something we don't like to talk about. It's something we can embrace. It's not something we, we have to shy away from. Don't you understand what the doctrine of predestination means? It means God chose me, and God chose me, and God chose you, and as wicked and as sinful as he knows we were going to be, he chose us. It's a wonderful, it's a great, it's a wonderful doctrine in the word of God. Okay, we believe that. So if we believe predestination, Brother Brett, what's the difference between us and Calvinists? Ah, here we go. It's the method through which God predestinates us. It's the method through which he predestinates us. Let me read for you Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first, firstborn among many brethren. We are predestinated through the foreknowledge of God. That is how we are predestinated. Look at our text verse. It's 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He chose us because he knew we would choose him. Now, this is where the people we call Calvinists call us Armenians. The first time a Calvinist called me an Armenian, I was like, I'm not from Armenia, the country. Why are you calling me an Armenian? 
But what they mean by that is there's a man, his name was Jacobus Armenia. Jacobus Armenia was the first man to really come up and go against John Calvin and his five doctrines of grace. So while uh, they call us Cal- while we call them Calvinists, they call us Armenians. But 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 here's the thing: you can't get away from that verse. You can't escape 1 Peter 1, 2. It's in the Bible. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He chose us because we chose him. Calvinist hears you say that, and you know what they'll call you? They'll call you an open theist. I'll say, oh, that's, that's open theism right there. What's open theism? Open theism is the fact that, that is people that believe that God wants us to freely choose him. So he made his plans for us conditional upon our actions. So even though God is omniscient, he does not know what we'll freely do in the future. That's what they call us. Now, you know, this is just a term that Calvinists made up to describe us, and it's not even accurate. I don't believe that. They can call me an open theist all you want. That's not what I believe. I believe that, that, that Jesus made his plans for us because he does know what we're going to do in the future. Now, let me give you some Calvinistic response to this idea of we're elect according to the foreknowledge. First, they would say, okay, if that's true, then the word elect, it's nonsense. God using the word elect here, if that's the way it is, it's absolutely nonsense because he didn't elect anything. He just reacted to it. Forget about calling it the doctrine of election. Call it the doctrine of a reaction because he just reacted to us. They said he didn't elect anything. He just reacted to us. Okay. Well, my response to to that would be, okay, how can you say God reacted to us when he was first? When he was before the universe, before we were even, before uh, he said a millennia, before he said, let there be light, God existed. How can you say he reacted to us? Now, in their mind, the fact that God elected us because he knew the future doesn't make sense to them. But guess what? It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to make. God doesn't owe me an explanation. God doesn't owe you an explanation. God doesn't owe Calvinists an explanation. It is the way it is because that's the way God said it was. We aren't the ones that said elect according to the grace of God. I didn't get in my time machine and go back in time and have Paul put this in the Bible or Peter put this in the Bible. I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't put those words in there. God put those words in there. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. We didn't say that. God did. So one unique response from Calvinists to this foreknowledge, how they try to explain their way out of foreknowledge, I heard from Dr. John MacArthur. John MacArthur is a Calvinist. John MacArthur is a big Calvinist. And he's trying to explain his way out of foreknowledge. And this is, what, this, is, this, is what, this is how John MacArthur tries to explain his way out of Calvinism. I mean, out of the foreknowledge. This is John MacArthur's explanation. All right, in Luke 134, Mary said, How can I have a child seeing I know not a man. Now, this word is a Greek word, gnosko, okay? Now, obviously, this word gnosko, in, 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 it's, it's talking about knowing someone in a biblical sense. You know what I'm saying, okay? Now, I, I know John MacArthur is not saying knowing God in a physical sense, obviously, but we do know God in an intimate way. We can know God in an intimate way. And what he's saying is that the word know or gnosko in the, in, the, in the Greek, it means this knowing somebody in an intimate way. So when the Bible says that he had foreknowledge, it mean, doesn't mean that he knew that he made his choice depending on what we, because he knew what we were going to do. It means he just intimately knew us already in an intimate way. And that's how John MacArthur explains his way out of the foreknowledge right here in this verse. I got a few responses to this, okay? Um, um, the, wait a minute, where am I at? Okay, I'm over here. This is the shakiest thing I've kind of ever heard John MacArthur say. It's very, very shaky, and let me tell you why. 
I've already told you the word no in Luke 134 is the word gnosko. And the word gnosko is defined by the context in which it's used. And Luke, 34, Luke 134, it means to know somebody in an intimate way. But in a verse like Matthew 6, 3, where it says, When thou doest thine alms, let not thine hand know with the right hand do it. That's the same word, gnosko. And in that verse, no means to understand. So the word gnosko is, is defined by the context in which it's used. And, and the reason why this is so shaky for me is because the word foreknowledge in 1 Peter 1, 2, it's not the word gnosko. In fact, it's a Greek word you know. It's a Greek word I dare say you've used in the past couple years. It's a Greek word we use all the time in our English language. You know what the Greek word for foreknowledge in 1 Peter 1, 2 is? It's the word prognosis. Like when a doctor is giving you a prognosis, he's telling what you can expect in the future. Okay? What can you expect in the future so for so God through his prognosis God through his foreknowledge knew what we would choose and that's how he elected us so then the Calvinist says and I've heard Calvinists mock you know I, I'm not very political on Facebook I don't if I don't get very I try to keep it light on Facebook I don't get into many debates on Facebook but I'll debate a Calvinist I'm not afraid of that and uh, I had a Calvinist uh, uh, say, uh, mock me one time and says, oh, well, God choose, chose you because you chose him and you chose him because he chose you. And around and around we go in a great big circle. And I say, so? So what? Why can't it be that way? <clears throat> Listen, if God is omniscient and God is all knowing, that's the only way it can be. It can't be any other way. If he's all-knowing and he's omniscient, it can't be any other way. We can't escape the fact that we are predestinated because he knew we would be saved. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God is an established biblical principle. There's that phrase again. It's not something we made up. I don't have to understand it. I just have to accept it. My next statement what I'm going to do now is take a couple verses that prove Calvinism, and then we're going to examine them. I had to cut these way down. I had to cut these down to two. I had a lot more. But look, I want to have, I need to cut some out of here. So uh, I cut a lot of these out, so I've only got two. Uh, go ahead and turn to John 15, 16. That's where we're going to start. Well, let me read it for you. These are, these are verses that prove Calvinism. Okay, so... We believe that God chose us because we chose him. All right, well, let's look at what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 15, 16, Ye have not chosen me. Uh-oh, there goes my belief system. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whosoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Oh, I guess I didn't choose him. I guess the Calvinists are right. Well, here's the, you don't, we'll turn there later, but let me read it for you right now. Or like in Romans 9, 21 through 23, which says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? Now, here's a basic synopsis of what I just read you. God made someone like Moses to be a vessel of honor, to be a vessel of glory, to go to heaven. And God made someone like Pharaoh to be a vessel of destruction, to go to hell. And the vessel of destruction has no choice in how he's made. Absolutely no choice. He has no choice but to be a vessel of destruction. And, by, and listen, by themselves, these verses can sound confusing. I mean, I'm up here telling you that, that you have a choice, and the Calvinists just read you a verse where Jesus said you don't have a choice. You see how it can be confusing? But guess what? Context is key. Context 
is key. Let's look at John 15, 16 first. Jesus said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. And the Calvinist says, Ha ha, look, see, you didn't choose God. Okay? Well, I got some questions here. Who was Jesus talking to? And I asked the Calvinist that one time. I said, Who's Jesus talking to? And the Calvinist said, Does it matter who he's talking to? Oh, yes, it does does matter who he's talking to. Who is he talking to? Under what circumstances did he make this statement? And if we answer these questions, we get the true meaning behind the verse. Who Jesus is specifically talking to in this particular verse is extremely important. When he says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, he is specifically talking directly to his apostles. Jesus is speaking to them in the upper room after the foot washing. Okay, so that's where this is taking place. Let me, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it to you, but let me remind you of something Jesus had already said about his apostles. He said in John 6, 70 and 71, he said, Jesus answered them, this talking to the apostles, have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for uh, he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. What did we learn from this? We learn here that Jesus, tw Jesus chose the, the apostles, even Judas. Even Judas was chosen. So we go back to John 15. He's talking to his 11 apostles because Jesus, Judas had already left. He's talking to his 11 apostles and telling them, you didn't choose me, uh, I chose you. You see, uh, uh, when, when, uh, he's talking to his apostles and no one outside that group. Jesus isn't talking to Christians today in 2019 and telling us that we're a part of the 12. He's not doing that. It's eisegesis that, that leads someone to insert themselves into John 15. So what is eisegesis? Exegesis is when you interpret Scripture. Eisegesis is when you interpret Scripture through the lens of your own bias. That's what eisegesis is. And the only way that you can put yourself in John 15 is if you interpret it the way you want to interpret it through your own lens. But he's not talking to me, and he's not talking to you. He's talking to his apostles. Context is key. All right, now let me skip all the verses that I was going to go over. And uh, turn to Romans 9. Turn to Romans 9. I'll put all these others on Facebook for you. They're really cool. Uh, Romans chapter 9. You're going to stay in Romans chapter 9, mainly for the rest of the message. Oh, Calvinists love Romans 9. I love a lot of chapters, but they love Romans 9 more than the rest of them. Romans 9. Let's look at Romans 9, starting in verse number 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? Calvinists claim that these verses say that God made some vessels of honor and God made some vessels of dishonor. He made some people specifically for heaven. He made some people specifically for hell. From the very beginning, they claim that the vessel of destruction has no choice in how he's being prepared. Okay. Let me read for you another verse. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it. But I want you to keep in mind what I'm about to read you was penned by the same man that penned Romans 9. This is 2 Timothy 2. 20 through 21. That says, But in a great house are there not only vessels of gold and silver and of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. There are those vessels of honor and dishonor again. Verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So that means a man can choose to purge himself from these to become a vessel of honor. That means I have a choice. You know what that means? 
That means God knew that you were going to reject him. So from the beginning of time, he's been preparing some, that person that's going to reject him. From the beginning of time, he's been preparing them to be a vessel of destruction. From the beginning. And guess what? He knew who was going to accept him. And so if you've accepted Christ in here, guess what that means? That means from the beginning before time, he was preparing you to be a vessel of glory. A vessel to to show the riches of his glory. A vessel of honor. And he's been preparing you to be the vessel of honor since before time began. Praise the Lord for that. You know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And this is what they say in it. Romans 9 talks about Pharaoh, that Pharaoh didn't have a choice. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh didn't have a choice where he was going. But if you read Exodus 8, you know what you'll find? You'll find that, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God didn't always harden Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God did not push Pharaoh down a road Pharaoh didn't want to go down. That was the road that Pharaoh chose. That's the one he wanted to go down. God knew from the beginning, through his foreknowledge, through his prognosis, what choice Pharaoh would make. So he began to prepare Pharaoh to be a vessel of destruction from the very beginning and placed him in a position of destruction to further his will. But if a man can choose to purge himself from these to become a vessel of honor, then he has a choice. You can pick apart any Calvin, any verse Calvinist throws at you with these two things. And these are the two things that I want to tell you about. Number one, context. Any verse a Calvinist throws at you, number one, you can pick apart with context. And number two, you can pick apart with an established biblical principle. Those two things can... Pick apart any verse that Calvinists throw at you. Context or an established biblical principle. So let's get down to the nitty gritty, okay? For a Calvinist, it comes down to this. God's sovereignty versus free will. That's, that, that, that's what it comes down to for Calvinist. Calvinists love the word sovereign. They love the word sovereign. And look, I'm not saying it's not a good word. I'm not saying it's not a good word. It's a beautiful word. It means that God has supreme power. It means that God has supreme authority. It means that God is in control of everything. Uh, It's a nice word. It's a good word. I'm just saying it's not a biblical word. It's not a biblical word. I'm not saying it's a bad word. I'm not saying it's a made up word. I'm not saying it doesn't apply to God. I'm just saying you're not going to find it in this book. It's not in here. This King James Bible, you're not going to find it in there. The word sovereign is not in there. Now, the glorious is in there. Creator's in there. Mighty's in there. King of kings. Lord of lords. uh, Greatness, power, majesty, splendor. All those words are in there, but you're not going to find the word sovereignty. Now, I might just be nitpicking. I'm not saying we can't use the word sovereignty to uh, describe God. Obviously, we can. I'm just saying it's not in the Bible. And, uh, you know, just, I'm just saying don't base your whole, your whole doctrine on a word that's not found in the Bible. But like I said, I could be nitpicking there. But you know what? Uh, let's be honest. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Just because it's not in the Bible doesn't mean we can't use it. The word Bible is not in the Bible, but we still call this the Bible. Okay? And so I'm not saying it's not okay to use words that's not in the Bible. You know, like I said, maybe that was nitpicky. But, you know, God is sovereign. Listen, God is in control of absolutely everything. Let me give you some scripture. Romans, uh, Col- Col- Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jeremiah 32.17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Psalms 103.19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Psalms 115.3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Pleased. Psalms 135, 6, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did in the heaven and the earth and in the seas and all the deep places. Make no mistake about it, God is in fact sovereign. God is in complete control of this thing. We do not pick the next president. God picks the president. 
Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. This ship is going where God wants it to go. Proverbs 16.9, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Psalms 31.3, For thou art my rock, my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. So you see, God is in control. But just because God can steer someone's heart and just because God can lead us and guide us and direct us does not mean we do not have free will. Because free will is one of those established biblical principles that I was telling you about. It's an established biblical principle. Let me give you some scripture on free will. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 1 Kings 18, 21, And Elijah came unto all people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Uh, 1 Kings 18, uh, Deuteronomy 13, 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Both thou and thy seed may live. So this is where a Calvinist brain breaks. It just breaks. They say, look. Either God is sovereign and God is in control or man has free will, but it can't be both. It can't be both. You know what I've been accused of? I've been accused of, of, of trying to put our God in a box because I can't understand his complexity. You know what my response to that was? My response was, well, uh, when people say it either has to be God's sovereignty or man's free will, pick one. It can't be one or the other. It's those people who don't understand the complexity of how both can be true at the same time. Both are true at the same time. Talk about complex. You see, the Calvinist has to be able to explain everything. They have to be able to intellectually explain everything, and they can't understand how both can be true at the same time. Yes, our God is sovereign, and yes, we have free will. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both at the same time, and guess what? God does not owe us an explanation. He does not owe us an explanation. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God does not owe us an explanation. So you've got to understand that you and me see God in different ways. Me and you see God. The best analogy I can come up with is like me and you see God like, like we're in a video game. And we don't know what's around the other corner. And it's got multiple endings and we don't know how it's going to end. That's how me and you see life and see the world. God sees the world as a book that's already been written. And in the Bible, he's not only trying to get across things from his viewpoint, he's trying to get across things from our viewpoint. And that's why both things in the Bible are true at the same time. Now look, and, and even this analogy that, I, I, that I'm giving you, it doesn't come close to explaining how God really sees the world. But here's the thing, if free will didn't exist, my sin would be God's fault. If free will didn't exist, then God would be responsible for my sin. You know what? Romans 9 addresses this paradox. And uh, uh, let's, let's go back to Romans 9, the favorite chapter of Calvinists. Let's start reading in verse number 19. Thou wilt say unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing that formed it say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So this man is talking to this apostle, and he says basically, Okay, apostle, since no one can resist his will and God is in control of everything, then my sin 
is God's fault. And you know what the apostles' response to this was? The apostles' response was, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? He says, nay, but old man, who art thou that repliest against God? And so, and I'm not going to read the whole verses again. We just read them. But you know, the thing is, is that, 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 that God can make a vessel of honor however he wants to make a vessel of honor. He can make a vessel of dishonor however he wants to make a vessel of dishonor, however he wants to make it. And he can put those vessels wherever he wants to put them and and, and do whatever he wants to to them. The vessels of wrath are fitted for destruction and they are there to make God's power known. The vessels of honor are there to experience the blessings and glory of God and they are there to make known the riches of God. He can make these vessels any way he wants to. He can put them anywhere he wants to put them. But you get to choose which vessel you are. Do I have to read 2 Timothy again? If a man purge himself from these, he can be made into a vessel of honor. Yes, God made the vessels. Yes, he can put them anywhere he wants them. But which vessel you are is your choice. What vessel you are is your choice. And this brings us to the main point of Calvinism. It all boils down to this. The thing that without, there would be no need for Calvinism. And that's the first point, total depravity. Total depravity makes all the other doctrines necessary. It makes, if you didn't have total depravity, you wouldn't need the rest of them. The first, at the core, the first doctrine of Calvinistic grace makes all the others necessary. If a natural man can do nothing good, then that means he cannot do the good thing of choosing God. A Calvinist explained it to me like this. Say you had a buzzard and you had a rabbit. And on the floor you put a piece of dead rotting meat and right beside it you put a carrot. Which one is the buzzard going to go after? Which one is the rabbit going to go after? Why? Because it's in their nature. Your nature makes your choices for you. Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. A Calvinist says you cannot overcome your sinful condition and accept him. You are a dead man and you can do nothing to save your own life. You know what illustration they like to use here? They like to use the illustration of Lazarus. Lazarus was in the grave and there was absolutely was dead as a doornail and there's absolutely nothing that Lazarus could do to get saved. Jesus had to intervene and make Lazarus alive and they like to use illustration of Lazarus. So we say that faith comes before regeneration, but Calvinists don't say that. Calvinist says that regeneration comes before faith. Well, let's quickly look at two things. One, about this Lazarus illustration they use. Let's say I had a baseball player here. Baseball player is lost. He's unsaved. Can he still throw a ball? Can he pick up a bat? Oh, wait a minute. I, I thought he was dead. You see, being dead in your trespasses and sins isn't the same as being dead as Lazarus was. It's not the same. It's a faulty analogy. And so then they'll change it and say, well, they can't do anything good. Let's, let, let, let's look at that second. We know we cannot do anything good. There's none righteous, no, not one, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. In fact, we can't even get saved unless the Father draws us. That's what the Bible says in John 44, 4. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. I will raise him up on the last day. And this is true. Unless the Father draws you, there is no salvation. So my question is, what is this drawing? <coughs> What does this drawing look like? Well, this drawing is the preaching and teaching of the Bible. It's uh, other people praying for your salvation. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you and working on your heart. It's seeds being planted. That's the drawing of the Father. No man is going to come unto the Father unless that drawing happens. But does this mean that we cannot get saved? 
unless God gives us regeneration first. Well, the Calvinists would have you believe that faith is a gift. Turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. I've got two more scriptures I want to show you and we're done. Please bear with me. Bear with me. I know you've been here a while. I'm almost through this, okay? Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to look at two more scriptures before we get done very quickly. Ephesians chapter 2. Calvinists would have you believe that faith is a gift. And in fact, they even say the Bible says faith is a gift. And they use Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to prove that. The Bible says, for by grace, we know this verse, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So Calvinists say, okay, the faith in this verse is the gift. The last statement before uh, that connects to gift is faith. So since faith was the last thing that was said, then, then that means that the gift in here is faith. Okay. Let's have a little Greek lesson. Let's have a little Greek lesson here. All words in Greek have a way that they attach themselves to other words. Every Greek word has a gender. It's either feminine, masculine, or neuter. Every Greek word has a gender. The word faith in this verse is feminine. The word that, or in some translations it may be this, but the word that is neuter. So that means that the word that does not connect with the word feminine, okay? I mean, with the word faith, because it's feminine. Okay, so what does the word that, what does that connect to? Well, you know, every word in that first phrase or that first, for, be grace or, for by grace are you saved through faith, all those words, they're all feminine. So in that case, that connects to the whole idea. The whole idea is the gift. For by grace are you saved through faith. The whole thing together. The whole idea. And then a Calvinist would say, oh, you mean each piece of the idea. So you're saying grace is a gift and saved is a gift and, and faith is a gift. No, no. Why? Because that is singular. It's not plural. It doesn't say these are the gifts. It says that is the gift. This is the gift. So faith isn't the gift. Salvation is the gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, that whole process, that whole idea. And in fact, the gift of Ephesians 2.8 is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So, faith is not the gift. Turn to Galatians 3. This is the last scripture. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you the smoking gun against Calvinism. I'm going to give you the smoking gun against Calvinism, the thing that tears Calvinism down and is found in Galatians 3. Yes, we are depraved people. Yes, we can do nothing on our own to be saved. There is nothing good that I can do. There is no work that I can do. There is no work that I can do to merit salvation. There's no work that I can do. All that's true. However, let's take Galatians 3:11 and 12. Let's read them a statement at a time. Let's start at verse 11. It says, "But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God." Okay, let's stop. So that means that no man can be saved by the law. That means there's no work that I can do to get salvation. There's absolutely no work that I can do to be saved. Let's continue. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Let's stop there. Faith is the only avenue that can save me. It's the only thing. Nothing else can save me but faith. Keep this in mind. Let's continue reading. And look at this. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. I tear down Calvinism with this one statement. Faith is not a work. Faith is not a work. Yes, there is no good work that I can do to merit salvation. But the Bible teaches clearly, and this isn't the only spot. It's also one of those established biblical principles that faith is not a work. 
No matter how depraved I am, the Bible teaches that faith in and of itself is not a work. Therefore, since it is not a work, it is something that an unregenerate man can do. Yes, God is sovereign. But guess what? I also get to choose because I have a free will. Jesus said in the book of Luke, I come not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He also said, I tell you nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. How can it be true, Brother Brad? How can it be true? How can God be in control of everything and predestinate and preordain and elect, but at the same time we have free will? Guess what? It's a mystery that we aren't supposed to know. We're not supposed to know it. We're just supposed to accept it. Let me ask you a question. Who lives your Christian life? Who lives it? You do? Okay. So everything good you do in your Christian life comes from you. Okay. Where does that good come from? Okay. So you're saying God lives your Christian life. Okay? We might have some friends that might disagree with the fact that God lives our Christian life. You see, it's not an easy question to answer, is it? But don't worry, Paul had problem with it. He had a problem with the same question. He said, he, he said in Galatians 2, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, nevertheless I live, yet not I, uh, uh, but Christ liveth in me. Paul didn't even know the answer to that question. So guess what? If Paul's okay with not knowing a mystery, then we should be okay with not knowing a mystery too. We don't have to explain everything. We're not supposed to explain everything. Look, I am sorry if I took y'all down a long, boring road, but I'll tell you this. If, If you don't take anything else away from this today, take away the fact that God chose you because you chose him. Guess what? I chose my wife. And my wife chose me. Why? Because we love each other. And because we love each other, we chose each other. Let me leave you with this one verse, last verse, Mark 8, 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We do have a choice. God is sovereign. We do have free will. Faith is not a work. It is something that an unregenerate man can do. Thank you, Lord, for choosing me. And I thank God one day when I was nine years old, I chose God. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.